Hi, everybody. This is Bob Gale, co-creator of Back to the Future, and you're listening to Brad Gilmore. Doc! 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 Okay, relax, Doc. It's me. It's me. It's Martin. Oh, I can't be. To send you back to the future. Yeah. Oh, I know you did send me back to the future, but I'm back. I'm back from the future. Great. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Doc. Uh, are you telling me that you built a time machine? Out of a DeLorean? The way I see it, if you're going to build a time machine into a car, why not do it some style? Hello, everybody, and welcome to Back to the Future, the podcast, the only podcast looking back in time, the greatest film trilogy of all time, Back to the Future. My name is Brad Gilmore. Welcome to season 10. Um, I have recorded a lot of episodes for this season and switched computers, lost a lot of files, the, the Paradox recordings, a couple of uh, interview segments that I did. So I've been working on trying to get those back in order. So forgive me, this is kind of more of a time capsule episode in some ways. We're going to be looking at 20 Things You May Have Missed in Back to the Future Part 1, which is a What Culture video. I'm just going to give live commentary. I haven't watched the video yet, but I'm going to watch it with you all for the very first time. And um, this will give me a little bit of time to try to go back and re-record a lot of things and get the schedule back in order. Back to the Future of the Podcast, Season 10, still in full effect. What's been your favorite episode thus far? Leave me a five-star review. Let me know in the review section on Apple Podcast, and I will read that review here on the show. Let's check. Is there anything new that I haven't done? Is there a new one? I think I've read them all to date. So let's just see if there is one. Back to the Future of the Podcast. Pulling it up. I believe I have them all on here. Yeah, I've read them all. But go ahead and go do that, please. I would really appreciate that. Um, why do we only have 4.7 stars? Oh, somebody, I'll tell you why. We have one review where somebody said best thing ever, but only gave me three stars. <laughs> Everybody else is giving five. So there we go. That explains it. But go ahead and do that. But let's not waste any time. Let me go to my 20 things you may have missed in Back to the Future Part 1 here on Season 10 of Back to the Future, the podcast. <laughs> All right, so here we are. We're going to do this thing cold and watch 20 things you somehow missed in Back to the Future Part 1. We did this earlier in the season with Part 3. I'm jumping all around. Y'all like it. You know you do. <laughs> What's up, pinheads? I hope you're having a great Memorial Day weekend. Let's uh, let's watch this video. Let's, let's live react. Let's just see what the hell's going on here. Ever since H.G. Wells wrote The Time Machine in 1895, everyone has fantasized about what they would do if they could travel to the past or the future. Facts. This concept has been explored in Bill and Ted, Groundhog Day, and of course their spiritual and thematic equal, The Terminator. But the most celebrated time travel movie has got to be Back to the Future. The premise Facts. is genius. What if you went back in time and stopped your own parents from meeting, meaning you were never born? Sub-question, what would happen if you just smashed your own mother? But amazing as Back to the Future is, the behind-the-scenes dramas references to other films, sneaky cameos, and little easter eggs are just as fascinating as the film itself. My name is Adam Cleary, and these are 20 What's up, Adam? films you somehow missed in Back to the Future. Number 20, oh, the head producer hated the title. Bob Gale came up with the idea for Back to the Future after seeing an old yearbook photo of his father and wondering if they would have been friends if they went to school together. Along with director Robert Zemeckis, they agreed Back to the Future would be a great title. However, Universal Pictures head producer Sidney Scheinberg did not. He sent a note to Steven Spielberg telling him to change the title to Spaceman from Pluto. Now, Spielberg knew it wasn't really a good idea to tell the most powerful man in Universal Pictures that his title sucked, so he just pretended that he must have concocted it as a joke. Schienberg was too embarrassed to correct him and let the name be. But look closely though, as when the family on the farm look at the DeLorean, the son shows his father a comic entitled Space Zombies from Pluto. Number 19. All right, let's stop there. Obviously, y'all know about this one. I wrote about this one in the book. We've talked about it on the podcast before. Um, Sid Scheinberg definitely had that idea, and I don't know how many of you have actually gone out and read the note that he sent to Bob Gale and Bob Zemeckis, but here it is. This is um, this was to Spielberg, Steven Spielberg, on October 17th, 1984, from Sid Scheinberg, subject, Back to the Future, 
and CC'd was Bob Zemeckis and Bob Gale. Here is what Sid Scheinberg said. Although I believe that the present draft is terrific and I marvel at the improvements that have been made from the Columbia version, I continue, and what he means by that is the movie was set up at uh, Columbia Pictures under Frank Price. Um, I continue to believe the title leaves much to be desired. There are a number of reasons why I found the title less than, quote, wonderful, but my primary concern is that it appears to make the picture a genre picture. A genre picture. I think the script and hopefully the film deserve a better title. This is such a... He is so confident in this take, too. This is what I love it. Now that I have buttered you up, I would suggest we consider the title Spaceman from Pluto. Now, let's take a pause here. Does that not sound like a genre movie? (laughs) Sounds like a B-movie from the 60s. Underpinning these suggestions are the following thoughts. One... Modify the dialogue on page 35 so that Sherman calls Marty a spaceman from Pluto. Uh, Number two, modify Marty's dialogue on page 77 so that he identifies himself as a spaceman from Pluto instead of Darth Vader from Vulcan. Number three, change the title of the book written by George and referred to on page 130 from a match made in space to spaceman from Pluto. Obviously, you get the idea. I am sure... There will be those who will argue that the movie will appear to audiences to be a cheap, old-fashioned sci-fi flick, like I just said. Nonsense, he proclaims, with an exclamation point. So nonsense, he exclaims. I think it's a kind of title that has a that has heat, originality, and projects fun. He put that in quotes. Most importantly, I think it avoids the feeling of a genre time travel movie, and he signs it, Sidney J. Scheinberg. Um, now the letter that he wrote back to him, let's see if I can find the memo that Spielberg wrote back to him. Uh, I know I have it here somewhere. Um, let's see. I can't find it. I found it before. Hold on, y'all. But you see what Sid Scheinberg really, and and what's actually kind of nice about it is although it's a horrendous horrendous idea. He was very sincere about it, and he thought about it. It wasn't some studio exec who just said, ah, oh, take take out this title. It sucks. You know, I don't know why I did a Vince McMahon impression there. It wasn't like that. He really, truly, honestly felt that he this was a good title, and we should go with this, you know? And I, I think that as sweet as it was and how you crafted an argument for it and, and, and what have you, it was just such a bad idea. Such a bad idea. Um, do have I found this yet? Uh, Moon River. Let's see. So this is apparently what Gail said the letter was. Hi, Sid. Thanks for your most humorous memo. We all got a big laugh out of it. Keep them coming. <laughs> I feel like I've read something differently. Hold on. Do I have it in here? Y'all bear with me for a moment here as I thumb through my book. I swear that there's a... I think I just passed it. That was the letter that I wrote there. Let's see. Here, I'll read selections from Back from the Future, a book. Spielberg, Zemeckis, and Gale were all floored by the suggestion that Spaceman from Pluto was a better title than Back to the Future. When the two Bobs asked Steven what should be done about this major suggestion from the studio head, he had the perfect idea. Steven wrote a note back to Sid Scheinberg telling him what a great laugh they all had at his memo and that everyone on the set really enjoyed the joke. After Steven sent this letter back to Sid's office, the proposed title change was never brought up again. This wasn't the end of Spaceman from Pluto, however. In the 2018 film A House with a Clock in Its Walls, starring Jack Black, there is a reference to the title that never was. During a scene in the movie when the character Lewis gets off the bus and and is met by his uncle, Jonathan Barnevelt, played by Jack Black, the two walk past a movie theater showing a fictional film called, you guessed it, Spaceman from Pluto. So there you go. There you have it. Spaceman from Pluto. Um, so Sid Scheinberg was 
almost, almost the guy who did it. Um, so let's go to number 19. In an orgy. When Marty huh? McFly first skates to the town, there is a cinema in the background which is advertising the film Orgy American Style. That's not a joke, though, as Orgy American Style is a real Rudy film, and one of its stars, George Buck Flower, is in Back to the Future. In the 1955 timeline, Buck's character Red Thomas has posters plastered all over the city to announce his candidacy for the mayor's office. In the- uh, that is not accurate. 1985 timeline, he appears as the bum who calls Marty a crazy drunk driver when he crashes the DeLorean. Number eight. The Red Thomas thing um, is hotly debated amongst fans and always has been. However, I believe it's been debunked several times that he is not the bum. So let's see if it says here. This is uh, Red Thomas's fake biography. Though... Largely thought to be the same character as Red the Bum, they are not. According to Bob Gale's commentary on Back to the Future DVD set, the name of the bum was ad lib by Michael J. Fox. Gale also commented that the photo of the mayor in 1955 on the side of the campaign van was from a was that of set decorator Hal Gaussman, uh, whereas the bum was played by George Buck Flower. So there you go. There you have it. So they're wrong. 18. The name of the mall changes. Doc reveals his time machine to Marty outside the Twin Pines Mall. After Doc is gunned down by terrorists, Marty uses the DeLorean to escape the criminals and accidentally goes back in time. He then decides to return a couple of minutes earlier so he can stop Doc from suffering his grisly fate. Only this time, the sign says Lone Pine Mall. That's because when Marty drove out of the farm in 1955, he crashed through one of two trees. After he does this, the farmer screams, My Pine! You see, Marty, the smallest alterations in the past can cause changes in the future that you can never imagine. Number 17, Mr. Peabody and Sherman. There are many iconic stories where time travel is integral to the plot. Primer, Avengers Endgame, X-Men Days of Future Past, and of course, Mr. Peabody and Sherman from the adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. In Peabody's Improbable History, a super intelligent dog called Hector Peabody traveled through time with a young boy called Sherman to teach him about history. Because the show was so popular, Robert Zemeckis knew he had to reference these characters in some way. When Marty travels to 1955, he crashes into a farmer's barn. The family mistake him for an alien and try to shoot him. As Marty drives away, the farmer tries to blast the DeLorean, but indirectly hits the post box, which has the name Peabody written on it. And as an extra little nod, the farmer's son is credited as Sherman. Number 16, the first okay. scene tells you... I think we all knew about the Lone Pine Mall and the, the Sherman and Peabody thing, right? ...how the movie is going to end. After Marty uses the DeLorean to travel to 1955, he tracks down Doc to find a way to return to his timeline. Doc believes the only power source that could allow the DeLorean to time travel is a bolt of lightning. Luckily, Marty knows the exact day and time the town's clock tower will be struck by lightning. Thus, Doc climbs the clock tower and iconically recreates an already famous moment from 1923 comedy Safety Last, where silent era star Harry Lloyd, no relation, performed the same dangling stunt. But We've talked about this a lot, and of course, we know it's referenced in the opening uh, credits, in the the opening credits where you Doc's see the clock. Showcasing his array of clocks. On one of the tables, there so is I, a miniature... So if you're a Back to the Future fan, like, you know, who's listening to this podcast, you have not missed this. This is, uh... This is one I think we all know. Of the clock face from Safety Last with Harold Lloyd, cleverly mirroring the very end of the film. Number 15, redubbing dialogue. It is well documented that Crispin Glover didn't have a good relationship with the film's director, which led to him being recast in the sequels. But there is one thing you can't take away from Glover with his nervous energy. He was born to play Marty's wimpy father, George McFly. But the thing is, Glover was too nervous and stuttered through most of his lines. He got so worked up before shooting one scene, he lost his voice, forcing him to mime his dialogue and dub it in later. Oh, and while we're on the subject of dubbing, the jet engine used to create the storm that stops Doc hearing Marty really did stop Doc from hearing Marty. It was so loud they had to dub their lines back in afterwards. Number 14, dialogue was... The the dubbing of the lines is something that I think we should investigate further. Um... Crispin, I think, had such an interesting way of talking in his line deliveries in Back to the Future. Um, and he's so, you know, as he is with everything, we've had him on the show before. I'm grateful to have talked to him. But he's so uh, of an interesting cat that, yeah, I, I kind of I can kind of go for that. But let's 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 do a little bit of research here. 
Crispin Glover lost voice in Back to the Future. I don't, I, I, I see how, where did they hear that? I never, I never heard that one before. Huh. Anyway, well, there you go. I don't know if that's true. I'll have to, look. I'm good. That's a, uh, that is a Stephen Clark question. Because I, I, I don't know about the dubbing because he was so worked up. Altered after 9-11. After the tragic attack on the World Trade Center, many programs on television were altered to remove any mention of terrorism. Now, in Back to the Future, Libyan terrorists give Doc a batch of plutonium under the impression he was going to build them a nuclear bomb. Realizing he's double-crossed them, they just shoot him dead instead. When Marty travels to 1955, he writes a letter to Doc, which informs him he will be killed in 1985. When Doc rips up the letter, Marty shouts out, You'll be shot by terrorists! When the film was aired after the 9-11 attacks, the scene was edited so Marty just cries out, You'll be shot! Anytime the letter is shown on screen, the words, by terrorists, are digitally removed. Number 13, Doc bribes a cop. As Doc is setting up the power cables at the clock tower, a nosy cop appears from behind, looking suspiciously at the DeLorean. When Doc says he's conducting a weather experiment, the police officer requests to see a permit. As Doc shows him this, air quotes, permit, the shot cuts to Marty. A deleted scene reveals that Doc made the copper stay quiet about his little experiment by by bribing bribing him, him, but why would you cut that? Well, because while that's going on, Marty starts worrying that going on a date with his mother might turn him gay. Unsurprisingly, after filming, the director realized this was A, a very weird thing to say, and B, yeah, just a very weird thing to say, so he hacked it out. Number- well, yeah, I mean, the great cut. Uh, I think we talked about this with Frank. I understood what they're trying to do with this scene is, you know, trying to do something to uh, highlight the differences in, in 1950s and in 1985 vernacular, 55 and 85 vernacular. Gay was very much a, a word that was used a lot to mean happy. You know, even in the Flintstones theme song, we'll have a gay old time, right? I mean, but it was a good cut. Number 12, Biff's Lackeys. It's common knowledge that a young Elijah Wood appears for a few seconds in Back to the Future Part 2. Look, there he is taking absolutely nothing to Isengard or something. But Biff's flunkies are equally as interesting, because while the actors who played Skinhead and 3D went on to have minor success in the acting world, the actor who plays Match is Billy Zane. Yep, the guy from Twin Peaks, from Titanic, from Zoolander, from The Phantom, and going out with Kelly Brook. Number 11, Doc's entrance makes... I still want to get Billy Zane on this show so bad. I love Billy Zane, man. The Phantom's one of my favorite movies. Obviously, Back to the Future is my favorite movie. God, he'd be so much fun to have on the show. I've been in contact with his publicist before. Like, he he and his publicist, myself and his publicist, like, went back and forth on so many emails. And we were so close to getting something done during the pandemic. I don't know what happened, but I would love to have him on. Makes no sense. As Marty arrives at the mall to meet Doc, the DeLorean is unveiled to him and the audience for the first time. As the time machine reverses out of the van, the automobile's doors open vertically, revealing the driver and inventor, Dr. Emmett Brown. There's just one teeny weeny itty bitty little problem with this scene though, it doesn't make any sense. How did Doc get inside the DeLorean if the vehicle could barely fit in the back of the van? You would have to roll it in, then drive to where you were going, then roll it back out, get in, drive back into the van, then reverse it out when you wanted to make your entrance. Which I mean, yeah, sure, he could have done that, but he doesn't even realize Marty's there, so plot hole slightly. Number ten. Not a plot hole, but yes, if you want to nitpick any movie, you can find some flawed logic in the way that they're used, but when you're presenting the time machine for the very first time to the audiences, you want them to have like a holy crap reaction. Um, and that's what they did. By the way, while I'm thinking about it, because um, it's a little bit paradoxical that Doc uh, was in a, you know, w- w- the way that they revealed the DeLorean, I guess. I'm a bad segue, but I'm using it to say I have recorded the other two parts of the paradox script. It, the original file was deleted, and I was so frustrated after reading through that entire script that takes a long time, as you all know, that I've, I put it on the back burner because I was like, I'll get to it later in the season. But it, it will be coming out next, probably next week or the week after the, the next part and then the following part after that. Then Ronald Reagan, the actor? 
When Marty arrives in 1955, he has to convince Doc he has travelled from the future. Naturally, Doc challenges Marty's story and asks him who is the US president in 1985. When Marty correctly answers by saying Ronald Reagan, Doc scoffs at this proclamation because, well, at the time, he's just some actor you see in westerns. Speaking of which, when Marty realises he has gone back in time, he looks up at the Essex Theatre and notices it is playing Cattle Queen of Montana, a western released in 1954 starring, you guessed it, Ronald Reagan. Apparently, the producers and writers were worried that Reagan would be upset by these little jabs at his past, but story goes, he absolutely loved them. Number nine, Huey Lewis plays the... Yep, that's all factual. I think we all know that as Back to the Future fans. Um, you might have missed, if you're not like a re like multiple repeat watcher or a background watcher like now I've become, like I watch everything that's happening in the background every time I watch the movie now to see if there's something new that pops up for me. And um, if you are not one of those, you may have missed him on the Cattle Queen of Montana billboard, but you probably saw that. Too damn loud, Judge. When Marty auditions for the Battle of the Bands, the judge dismisses him for being too darn loud. In case you didn't notice, the judge who says this line is played by the lead singer of the rock band, Huey Lewis and the News. Alright, so long story, one of the most defining soundtracks of the 1980s is the theme song for the 1984 film Ghostbusters, which was played by Ray Parker Jr., but you already knew that. What you didn't know is that Huey Lewis and the News sued Parker, stating that the track was just a rip-off of his song, I Want a New Drug, which came out earlier the same year. Huey was frustrated that his work could be stolen for other projects, since it meant studios could theoretically rake in millions while he made absolutely nothing. This revelation inspired him to work on a blockbuster where he hoped to create a new song that would be become a classic. For Back to the Future, he devised Back in Time and the band's most iconic song, The Power of Love. This is the song that Marty plays in the audition, hence why he's in the film, and the more you know. Number eight, the film tried and... Go rock Power of Love in your core right now. Like, that song goes so hard. Like, it's ridiculous. Failed to promote raisins. Did you notice the California raisin sign in the film? Well, yes. if you didn't, don't worry, most people didn't, and that was apparently a huge problem. The manager of the Californian Raisin Board paid $100,000 for their product to appear in Back to the Future What's there? under the condition it would be a story element. When a scene was shot of Marty eating raisins, the director worried it looked like he was eating a bowl full of dirt, and so cut the scene. Raisins were meant to appear in at least four scenes, but in the end, only an advertisement for the product appears one time on a bench. The California Raisin Board was was livid since the advertisement could barely be seen and it was right beside a homeless person who was, as I'm sure you remember, literally being played by a porn star. And even more funny than that, everyone remembers the Burger King shot though, which, to add insult to injury, wasn't even a product placement. Woo. Number seven, the DeLorean's top speed. Very short. All right, this practice, is one that I'm what ready speed for. They associate with this film, and they will all categorically say 88 miles per hour. The only problem with this though is that DeLoreans can only get up to 85 miles per hour. Not a big deal in the grand scheme of things. I mean, they can't travel through time either, but it did mean that all the speedometers had to be customized on set, so they went up to 90. Number six. Okay, so that one is not accurate, according to my research. Because the DeLorean speedometer that they put in there, it wasn't because the car couldn't go up to 88. Of course the DeLorean can go at 88. Um, some people say that the DeLorean could actually do upwards of 100, 110. But the government regulations from the manufacturers is what limited the speedometer to 85, right? So, in in my opinion, and, and like, and if you even go back and look at the speedometer, like I'll I'll bring it up here. It, it, have you ever noticed that? What speed they so uh, fifty five is kind of like highlighted we orange. This film and they will all. The reason is because that was like the the recommended speed, uh, and they, it was required for them to highlight that, um, due to the government regulation. So there you have it. 80 either, but it's five. Number six, all the speedometers had to be customized on set, so they went up to 95. Number six, the Stanley Kubrick reference. In Marty's first scene in Back to the Future, he plays a single power chord using an amplifier, which blasts him off his feet. 
To set up the amplifier, Marty inserts keys into a slot which reads oh, yeah. CRM114. This is a nod to visionary director Stanley Kubrick, who used the term CRM114 in three of his films. As the registry number of the spaceship in 2001 A Space Odyssey, the name of an encryption device in Doctor Strangelove, and on a bottle label in A Clockwork Orange. The term has appeared in other properties including Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Heroes and Men in Black 3. This is probably the most obscure in-joke in the entire film, but still, I'm sure film fanatics get the reference and still appreciate it. I'm sure y'all knew that one. Why does Hill Valley look so familiar? Originally, the film was going to be shot in the city of Pentaluma, California. Realising it would be too chaotic and expensive if the film suffered any difficulties, which it totally did, by the way, the producers decided to shoot Back to the Future in the back lot of Universal Studios. The town where the story takes place, Hill Valley, is actually called Courthouse Square. You probably recognise it as it's appeared in countless television shows and films including Bruce Almighty, The Incredible Hulk, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Gremlins to Kill a Mockingbird, The Offspring music video Why Don't You Get a Job and the very first episode of the classic show The Twilight Zone. Number there you four, go. We really all knew that. Billy Van Halen. When George refuses to date Lorraine, Marty breaks into his house pretending to be an alien and plays deafening music to wake him up, as you do. Before Marty plays the song, you can see him place a tape in the recorder which is labelled Edward Van Halen. But because the music played in this scene isn't from any Eddie Van Halen songs, fans wondered if it was actually him who was making the music. And yeah, it was. Eddie Van Halen agreed to play a tune for the scene, but his producer didn't allow him to perform any of his band's music. Also, the tape was meant to be labelled Van Halen, but his producer refused this request since it was the name of the band, which the studio did not have rights for. Instead, the singer said they could use his real name, Edward Van Halen, and he would compose a unique track for the scene. Number three, Johnny B. Good. While Marty plays Johnny B. Good, he emulates as many rock star tropes as possible. Viewers will recognize all of these traits, Windmill. but it's hard to pinpoint which ones belong to which musician. Thankfully though, I am here and I am brilliant. The duck walk that Marty performs was popularized by Chuck Berry, the creator of the song Johnny B. Good. At one point, he violently taps the guitar string, much like Van Halen. When Marty plays the instrument behind his head, this is an homage to Jimi Hendrix. He kicks the amplifier just like Pete Townsend from The Who, then he finally wriggles around on the ground like Angus Young from ACDC. Although Michael J. Fox didn't play the guitar in this scene, he was taught how to hold the instrument by musician Paul Hansen, so his performance appeared more natural. Hansen even cameos as one of the members of Marty's band, The Pinheads. Number two, the dog Lorian. When Doc deduces the DeLorean must travel at 88 miles per hour to time travel, he performs a test to see if a living creature can survive traveling through the time stream. He places his dog, Einstein, in the vehicle and then uses a remote control to make the car travel at 88 miles per hour. While shooting this scene, the car is obviously not remote controlled. Trick photography is used to give the illusion the driverless car is moving at great speed while the dog, who is actually called Tiger by the way, is inside. And as you might have guessed, when there is a close-up of the dog in this scene, the car just isn't moving at all. But the director knew this scene was so crucial they needed at least one shot of the car driving really fast while the dog is clearly visible. So they had a stuntman do it while wearing a dog costume. Yep, that's, <laughs> that's what that is right there. The Doggy man costume. Hey, man, you got to protect these animals. Pretending to be a dog driving a car. What a film. Number one, Eric Stoltz is still in the movie. Although Michael J. Fox was offered the role of Marty, he couldn't commit to the part because he was working on the TV series Family Ties. As a result, Eric Stoltz was cast as the lead character. Stoltz worked on the film for five weeks but was fired because Robert Zemeckis thought he was too aggressive after he broke Biff's collarbone while shooting a scene. Fox was rehired, but he could only work at night since he was filming Family Ties during the day. When he finished working on the show for the season, Fox then filmed his day scenes for Back to the Future. Naturally, Zemeckis had to reshoot all of the scenes with Marty, but, um, forgot one of them. When Marty punches Biff, you can clearly see Fox swing a punch, but it's Eric Stoltz in the following shot. Most people don't notice, but still, he is there. So, there you have it. Those are 20 things. Still you debated, to the but I think Red that they're right. Man, who is now truly wondering what would happen if he got sent 30 years back in the past and somebody asked him who the president was. Let me know what you made of it. All right, well, there you go. Um, There's a few things I'm going to ask Stephen Clark about. The dubbing of the lines is the main one. Um... I've heard all this other things before. Some we've talked about on the show before, but we're definitely going to talk to him about that. So I'll be back probably with another clarification series. Um, but anyway, guys, is there anything in Back to the Future Part 1 that you think only you have seen and everyone else has missed? If so, send me an email. 
bradgilmore11 at gmail.com. You can hit me up on Twitter at Brad Gilmore, Instagram at Brad Gilmore. While I'm at it, check out Clue the Movie podcast, where me and Jeff Smith break down a minute of Clue the Movie, one minute at a time. Um, what else am I working on? What else am I working on? Got another book coming out. Uh, I'll announce that soon when I'm allowed to. Um, album on the way. There's something else I wanted to tell everybody about. I don't know. There's all kinds of things. Oh, oh, check out my, um, I do an entertainment segment for the local Houston TV affiliate, the CW affiliate, CW39. Go to CW39.com and check out my CW39 Spotlight series. Um, where we talk to actors. I talked to a couple of people from the cast of Netflix's FUBAR, the Arnold Schwarzenegger action comedy, um, which is really good, actually, by the way, on Netflix. So, until next time, uh, my name is Brad Gilmore. This has been Back to the Future, the podcast, and we will see you again in the future.